All right, welcome back, folks. This is Jamie Oichel from runningrestaurants.com, where we bring you the tips, tools, and techniques you need to make your restaurant more profitable and successful. I've got a great session for you today on marketing, data, and technology. Joining me is Hope Neiman, Chief Marketing Officer at Tilster, which is a restaurant technology company. Welcome, Hope. How are you? I'm fine, thank you. I appreciate the time to be on with you. Awesome. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. I really want to get into this stuff because I, I love the marketing uh, chatter and I'm um, looking, looking forward to get into, into, into that. All right. So let's, let's talk right about um, what you guys do in this convergence that we're in right now of technology and marketing for restaurants. What would you say is exciting you right now? What do you think? Um, I think it's actually the fact that restaurant is ca- restaurants are actually catching up to what the rest of digital commerce was um, happening. When I came to Tilster seven years ago, um, restaurants were really in the dark ages. You couldn't go in. People were just very used to traditional means and nobody really thought this was going to converge. In the last seven years, particularly the last three years, being able to see that kiosk is making an enormous comeback. Digital ordering is exploding. Uh, all forms of delivery are happening. And most importantly, restaurants are starting to use digital as a means of engagement, of actually measuring their customers, who's coming, how often they're coming, what they should be saying to them in a way that I don't think we would have envisioned even two years ago. Yeah, well, you're you're absolutely right there. And I want to get into a lot of those topics that you just talked about, because you use the phrase catching up. And I think that's exactly right. And a lot of folks are still not even close in the restaurant space to technology. So let's talk about restaurant data because that is the buzzword for lack of a, a better term here. And folks want to know what it is, what they're doing with it. You, you hit on a few things right there, how folks are starting to use it. But what, what can folks these days do with data to encourage repeat visits, to uh, encourage or increase spends? What do you think? Well, one of the most important things is very old school. And that's using email effectively. Um, A lot of people look at it and go, oh, I've been doing that for years. I've had an e-club. I've done this. That may be. But consumers today have more than the restaurant down the street as a competitor to their particular, the restaurant we're talking about. They're really looking at the competition as what is Uber doing? What's Amazon doing? What's my favorite retailer doing? They expect you to be personalized. They expect you to be sending email at a time of what they want and to giving them information that's meaningful to that guest. So being able to know who on your list might have been delivery customers versus in-restaurant customers, who tends to come for lunch versus dinner versus breakfast, and just little clues. There's that bit about getting a bit too creepy in terms of saying, hey, Jamie, I know you were here on Tuesday. Why don't you come next Tuesday? That feels a little bit too close to home, but if they know that you came in for lunch and being able to flag what the latest LTO is around a lunch meal and saying special for you, that makes guests feel very welcome and very excited to patronize that restaurant. The other thing that's really important about it is people forget about the emotional hooks. So one of the biggest dangers of digital is that you focus too much on the numbers and you don't focus enough on the message to what is important to that guest. You want them to feel that your business is like a friend and therefore they don't want to leave you. If you make it feel very cold, they're much more likely to walk away and go down the street and be willing to go somewhere else for a change of 50 cents or a dollar. Let, let, me, let me ping you there a little bit. You, you mentioned email, obviously, and you're right. People are, are saying, hey, I need to move away from email, forget about it. But probably what I like most about your point is, 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 is hey, you're probably not doing email well enough or you're not personalizing it and you're not using it the way you should today. So don't go away from it, use it better. And you also talked about more options. You talked about competition there, um, segmenting what people do. And you're right, yes, yeah, definitely stay away from that creep factor because I don't, I don't, I don't want to feel that uh, as, as a customer. But so those are some interesting parts of data. What, what, what else there? I mean, what, uh, what about increased spend and can, can people do in this, this kind of digital touch? What do you think? So coming up with, there are two things actually on spend and they're both very different. One is how do you drive more visits from people who don't visit you frequently enough? So if, if you're like most restaurants, a very large portion of your user base is only coming maybe once a quarter, maybe a little bit more, but not a lot more than that. And then at the other extreme, you have guests that might be coming as frequently as once a week. 
those two kinds of audiences really are looking for very different things. If you have somebody coming once a week, they know and understand your menu, they're very aware of what's going on, but you may be able to give them something special to incent them to spend a little bit more because they're already trusting of you. That's one way of a very frequent visitor spending an extra dime or a quarter every time they come is a way to increase your total revenue. By the same token, somebody who's only coming once a quarter, if you can get a large portion of that audience to come one and a half times a quarter, so instead of coming four times a year, you might be getting six visits a year, you've effectively increased 50% the kind of revenue that you're getting out of those customers. So by really understanding how to separate off who you're talking to, you have ways of raising all boats um, in the process. Yeah, maybe let's, um, and you're right, the, 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 we have an article somewhere on the site, the profit power of one more visit, be, and it's dramatic. That Just bringing that, that occasional person in one more time has huge impacts to your bottom line, so you definitely want to have that mentality. Um, for you think, but just to get nerdy for a second, I'm curious, don't go too tech heavy, but like, how is this, how does that work? How does this happen where you can pick people out as this weird database and how can you query it and figure this stuff out? So just kind of a quick uh, tech stuff. What do you think? It depends what you have on information about that cast, but there are things that you can do in the old days, um, but you can now use them digitally are things like bounce backs. Come now. And if you come back in a month, we're going to give you something special. You don't have to give them their are in the restaurant, but you're giving them an incentive to come back in a very limited period of time. You can even do that in a very offline way. Print out on your receipt to say, come back. Um, if you bring in this receipt anytime in the next 30 days, we'll give you a small discount, a coupon, something else that's part of it. With digital, you can say, check in on our digital app and come back in the next month. I just got one of these from a restaurant yesterday. Um, if you come back again in the month of May, we're gonna give you something else. So those are very simple ways, especially if you know that the majority of your audience is not coming in very frequently, to bring them back and to use digital to do it very conveniently. To use that first example with a receipt, I have to remember to have the receipt, I better put it in my purse or my pocket. Now with digital, it's with you all the time. You have a reason, oh, that's right, I'm walking past that restaurant. I have that special offer now. The fact that it's in digital, it's always with you, makes it very easy to take advantage. Right, right. right. Yeah, the, the word I just wrote down was, uh, was reason. So uh, whenever I talk about going out to eat, you, you have 50, you have 100 places to choose. And so what is the reason to choose place A over place B? And sometimes it's as little as, oh yeah, there's an email sitting in my, in my thing that I can grab five, you know, five bucks from or 10% on. And those things make a difference. So let's, let's talk about uh, online and mobile ordering, which is going bananas, right? I mean, just going crazy right now. Um, a lot of people love it. It's ease of use. Big brands are spending a lot of money to be there. They're there already. Smaller brands need to get into it. Um, is, is there still hope for small brands and independents to compete with um, what the bigger folks are doing in these arenas? How can they compete? What, what, do, what, in essence, what do restaurants need to get right in online and mobile? What do you think? So there are a couple of things. One is it has to feel authentic. So something that feels like that particular restaurant. So whether you're an independent, you have a reason for being, you have a reason that people come to you on it, make sure that gets dialed up as part of your digital ordering so that everything doesn't look the same. Because now you're actually giving them a reason to go to the competition if it always simply looks the same. Even a smaller brand, you can grow, we have a number of brands that I would call on the smaller side that um, are doing huge percentages of business in digital because they're doing, the first one that I mentioned, it feels very authentic to what the brand is doing. But the second is they're ensuring that there are convenience features and things that make it really um, desirable for their audience to come back to them. So you don't always have to give a discount or a coupon. If I'm a busy mom and I have three kids and a husband and everybody likes their food differently, I set it up once, it's already there, I can press instant reorder and it now takes me about a minute and a half to place that order for my family as opposed to going to someplace different where I now have to ask John and Susie and Billy and my husband what they all want to have, how they want to have it, 
somebody's going to complain that it isn't what they wanted. Um, so that's a bigger reason. That's also a very profitable reason for brands to be in the digital realm uh, and to give customers a reason to come back to visit them. Yeah, I will echo that for you there uh, because I, I've started to use that, that feature, right? So you've, you've, you've created, in essence, an account on, on a place that you go to frequently and the apps are getting smart now. I tend, to, I tend to get the same darn thing every time I go to a certain place. You're not alone. Yeah, you're I just, just get the same alone. thing. And then now my kid, they, they get the same thing. And so when it says, do you want to just hit the button for your last order? And I can go, yes, because we're all, sometimes it's only two of us or three of us. But anyway, when we're all together, boom, I can hit that thing. I can save a lot of time. And so I, 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 really, I wrote that down. Convenience fa features is a big deal in mobile. You're seeing the, the smart um, operators use that. Authentic, I think is, authentic is a good point as well in that I want the, uh, the interface experience to look like their brand and not uh, like a generic, uh, you, know, uh, you know, some generic third party site necessarily. So, so no matter who you use as a restaurant, I would encourage you to, you know, whatever, maybe it's, you gotta pay a few extra dollars to get that, 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 that field. And, and I'm sure you can talk more to that aspect of how that's accomplished. But um, anyway. Some of, my, the voice. some of it's as simple as the voice of what you sound like. If your brand has a snarky attitude, yeah. and it's one of the fun things that people come to your restaurant for, your online site should have that same snarky attitude. It shouldn't just be what's being ordered. By the same token, digital can help you reveal things that are available. So for example, you may have lots of other ways to customize a sandwich behind the counter, and if a guest asks you for them, you would do it, but they may never think to do that. And oh, by the way, if they did, then suddenly you would be increasing your average check to a higher point. Knowing what somebody's ordering and making it easy to see what might go well or to just sort of um, suggest something in the process is another way to really understand not just what should happen in digital, but if you find that everybody loves guacamole on some kind of sandwich and it's going to add an extra two bucks to that sandwich, you might now take your counter crew and say, hey, you might want to suggest to them that would you like to add guacamole to the sandwich? And that's now increasing the revenue across all parts, all dispositions that people are coming in to buy from. Yeah, good point. And, the, and the next question I was going to ask you was about how to upsell inside of like those platforms where, you know, the downside of having that frequent order is I might just hit, you know, go and I'm done. Um, and so, and that's good, but you also want to then encourage uh, people to buy other stuff. Have you seen some, and you just mentioned it right there where you can customize a sandwich and maybe it's 50 cents here, 25 cents there. Any other kind of neat upsell techniques you've seen digital? So it's one thing that we do a lot of and that we spend a lot of time on is it's a difference between art and science. So you're looking at the data. What are people responding to? Are they not finishing the process flow if you put too many upsells in front of them? Um, so it's about changing it up. Sometimes it's being very overt. Would you like to make this a combo? Would you like to add a dessert? Sometimes it's a little bit covert. If you're letting somebody customize something in a way that says add extra turkey or just go to the end, you're giving them an opportunity to do that, but you're not making it painful or adding sort of extra time for those people that know exactly what they want and want to get to the end of the line. So. We're always trying to understand and watch the data to see what happens to those flows. Also, some different restaurants have different um, things that are important to them. So at lunchtime, if you have a line out the door, um, speed of service might be the single most critical thing, even above and beyond increasing average check. Although you wouldn't turn away average check, you want to get people through the line. Same time, uh, other restaurants are all about making average unit volume higher. They'll do anything that it takes to increase average unit volume. So that might mean bringing people in at off hours, even though you might be giving them a discount, that's revenue you didn't have. So you have to look to change those different choices in terms of what you're revealing, sometimes even changing it by day part in terms of what's available to a guest. Interesting. Yeah, I hadn't, hadn't thought that much about that aspect of it. Um, uh, quick, quick question, or, or let's, let's touch here quickly. The other side of online ordering and mobile is delivery. And some of it's takeout and, and order ahead and so forth, but a lot of it is delivery with third-party apps. And, and the trend here, again, is going up. It's just skyrocketing in terms of people that want the ease of use. What are you seeing with delivery? Where do you think things are headed? 
Uh, I think, I don't have a crystal ball, so I'm not sure where they're headed, but I think they're gonna keep growing for a while. Um, I think we're seeing two trends. Delivery through third parties is not going away. It's the equivalent in my mind of, if you're driving down the street, you're not sure what you wanna eat. And you're like, oh, maybe Thai sounds good, or maybe Chinese good, or maybe Mexican sounds good. When you're in an aggregated site, you have all of those options available. You have a chance to look at all of them and decide what you want. But many, what we're starting to see is a significant trend and consumers are actually saying this. If they want their favorite brand, they wanna go right to that brand and they wanna be able to buy from that brand. And so that really speaks to um, uh, last mile delivery, being able to, on a website of a brand, to be able to allow them to have delivery through a third party, or frankly, through themselves if they wanted to, but for most cases, it's really through a third party. It's interesting. Um, one of the pieces that I think is going through a shift right now is there's a lot of a land grab though, a lot of people offering free delivery or concern over it. I think consumers are waking up to the fact, we've seen it in our own research, they're willing to pay a certain amount. They're willing to pay $5. Up to that $5 threshold for delivery, they're very comfortable with it. The real issue is, depending on the size of the check, how much more they may be willing to do. And that's really where it's a bit of a problem for say QSR. If you've got a seven or $8 check on it, the cost of delivery is going to be significant relative to what you're paying. And I think that's still squaring itself out. The same way that when e-commerce went through this, first it was everybody resented paying for delivery, just like it was in restaurants. Then people were like, oh, I understand I have to buy a minimum amount in order to get free delivery or else I have to pay for it. And I think we're kind of in that mid-level cycle. I think we're waiting to see what happens with sort of as restaurants and delivery grow up as to what really survives in that process, what the expectation is for guests. It is different than e-commerce because there's also the issue of time. And I think consumers are starting to also understand that it doesn't just happen like that for most brands. And there's a bit of a frustration. So they're becoming more selective about when do I want delivery? And you know what? I'll just go and pick it up because it's on my way home. I don't really feel like waiting all that time. So we're starting to see order ahead for pickup coming back and also escalating at the same time as consumers are getting more discerning about which choice to make. Yeah, I hope you, you, you hit a lot of good stuff right there. I appreciate, I appreciate that. I, I, I would just follow up on, yeah, there's a land grab right now. It's a little chaotic. There's so many brands offering it. But the insight that, that you shared there is that um, it doesn't have to be free. I mean, the customer, we, we're doing this ourselves. We appreciate that it is saving us time. I don't have to go out. So yeah, I, I'm willing to pay three, four, five dollars $5 delivery fee to have it here. And so restaurants don't have to be afraid to charge that because the consumer knows the, the one, it's a cost, and two, it's a convenience. So if, if you start to layering that in, it makes sense. The fear that I see in the marketplace is the margins that some of the delivery folks are taking can be you know, a little bit steep. And so that needs to shake out so that it's profitable and makes sense for everybody. But um, hopefully in, in time that will happen. So you know, I, I want to go to uh, coupons. You touched on this, this quickly. Um, Consumers love them, right? I mean, we love to get discounts, of course, right? Um, and some restaurants are promotional and some are just not by nature. And so, anyway, best practices on coupons. Is it frequency? Um, the offer should be X good. I mean, what, what are you seeing work in terms of coupons and promotions? It depends on the brand. So there are some brands that are highly promotional and sometimes franchisees have pulled back and said, we don't want to do so many coupons. And there's a bit of a, of a dilemma then where consumers had expected it and not. We've counseled them to do things like offer a wide variety of coupons, but not all of them need to be very rich. It looks like you're giving something away and if you really want it. The second thing though that's really important to look at is um, don't just look at how much you're giving away, look at what items you're giving away. So for example, um, we've done coupons with some of our uh, customers where we've suggested having a very inexpensive drink. The cost of what you're giving away is almost nothing, right. but put a very short fuse on it. So say that it's only good tomorrow. There's this whole fear of missing out phenomenon that you're then playing into, which is, oh my God, if I go tomorrow, I get a free Coke. And by the way, while you're there getting the free Coke, you might also buy 
um, a side dish or a dessert or something else to eat. So giving away a little bit of something with the idea that, that you're bringing a guest in and have an opportunity to sell them something else, you have to look at the whole. What are you really gaining? Is it an incremental visit? You hope it is. Number two, is it incremental dollars that you wouldn't have? So while some people look at it and say, I'm giving away X, the greater good is so much higher. And more importantly, it's far more profitable. Right. Yeah. We, we talk in um, some of our, our recent webinars about this idea of a cash cow and it hits well to your point. If you're going to promo something and I, the, we use an example of garlic knots, which, you know, cost 50 to a dollar uh, to make. And meanwhile, you charge a customer $10. So they think they're getting a huge benefit, much like your example of the soda. You know, that's, you know, Sodas are two fifty, three bucks now at restaurants. So that, you know, and, but it literally costs the restaurant like nothing. And so, so high perceived value, low cost. Those are great promotional items rather than dollars off, percentage off. And and so it is, it is a trade off. And that little factor can be the difference that brings folks in. So think about how you can use the right items. I, I really like that. So I appreciate that. The, and the, the other side of promotions is loyalty. And I know you guys talk about this a lot. Big believers in loyalty and rewards. And again, that is something that can change the decision on where you go. Oh, I'm just one notch away from getting a reward at this place. How, how do you see restaurants using this well? Um, I'll give you the dirty little secret about loyalty. The biggest single thing about loyalty is it allows you to track every visit a guest does, which lets you be much smarter about what you want to give them and how you can bring them back because you know how to talk to them. That's the most important thing about loyalty. As far as what you give them, it's almost a quid pro quo between loyalty and coupons. Loyalty, are, loyalty is really the, the co implicit contract. You do X, we will give you Y. Consumers don't even realize how far away they are, especially if you gamify it a little bit, we'll give you six points for every dollar. Consumers don't wanna do math. They don't know how much more they have to buy. They just know that if they're coming in, they get something. They get something from you, they don't get it from somebody else. And that's a positive. Also gamifying, if you haven't seen them, being able to say, come in tomorrow and we'll give you double points. But you build into your program the ability to give away points somewhere along the line for free. Allows you to talk to that guest. Again, it's that fear of missing out component that's really important. The one danger sign that I would say about loyalty is make sure the structure is such that when you do give an award, any kind of an award to a guest, it makes sense based on the number of visits. So we've had customers that said, I don't want to give away much. And when you start to figure out the average number of visits and what somebody has to buy, their average customer isn't going to get a, a something, an award of some kind for two years. Nobody's going to wait two years. They're going to lose interest in the program. So make sure you have some things along the way that make it easy in a six or eight month time frame as a minimum for somebody to be able to earn something. Yeah. Yeah. Again, a handful of, of good insights there about loyalty. Um, I know I was shopping. This was a retail example, but I was looking for something and the retailer was using triple points. Uh, lo and behold, guess what happened? I, I ordered more, right? And so restaurants, same thing. It's double point day, uh, triple points on Tuesday, lunch or, or whatever. So use that mentality to your advantage. It, it, it does get the consumer's mind going. Uh, yes, we are bad at math, general, generally speaking. Uh, but yeah, I also, to echo your point about getting rewards, you know, don't make the reward unattainable. Don't keep it, uh, to your point, a year away. Uh, let them get something quick, even if it's something small. Uh, there was a, one brand I forget a while ago, but you know, after just like a couple visits, you get something small just to prove that that it works, right? That you'll get get it get get loyalty. So, so I think loyalty is a big deal. Um, hopefully, you know, bake that into your system, into your DNA of your restaurant. I think it's a big deal. Uh, as we as we start to wrap up here, I wanted to point out something that I saw uh, you write where you talked about a crawl walk run strategy for using this data. And so I really like that analogy. Walk us through it. So what it really is, is people get overwhelmed. Oh my God, there are all these digital tool sets. Start with one thing. Start with one thing that's manageable. Maybe it's email. Maybe it's just segmenting off your best customers and start to see and get comfortable with it. Move on to something where it might be digital ordering, where you're incorporating some couponing as part of that or something else with it. And then lastly, move on to, oh, wow, I now have all this data about these guests. 
what am I learning? What can I do? How can it impact my business overall? But one of the dangers with anything to do with data is there's so much of it, you, you have to almost um, sort of zone out on the white noise of all the data and focus on the goal that you have at any point in time, and then you can grow your goals over time. Yeah, let's let's just go to the la the last part there that can be the overwhelming part. Um, what but what what can it look like when things are hitting on all cylinders? I mean, what's that perfect scenario of a restaurant that if you if you were building a restaurant from scratch, what would you want to be able to do? Just kind of play that dream scenario. Well, if it's a dream scenario for me, it's everything. Um, I don't want to get rid of consumers, though. I mean, one of the things people talk about is, oh, I'm going to have a restaurant where you're going to walk in and everything's going to be done digitally and I don't need any humans to be there. That takes away from the warmth and the reason that you want to come. In a dream scenario, I come in, I have somebody to greet me, I have an easy way to get a table or maybe I sit down at the table, I have a way to order digitally that knows and understands who I am, that's flagging what's available to me, what I've had in the past. Um, they might even incentivize me if I'm sitting in the restaurant to get an added dessert added on or something else post my meal. Uh, I might be treated in a very special way. So maybe I get a better table if it's a, if it's a full service restaurant because I am a loyalty member or because I'm using that as a way to cash in my points in the process. And I'm being reminded why I wanna go back to that restaurant so that even if it's uh, a time when I wanna bring in food or I wanna order ahead or have delivery, that restaurant knows who I am. They're treating me in a very special way. Um, and they're being very respectful of the kinds of information that I've chosen to give them, not selling it off, not bombarding me with too many messages um, or things that really are irrelevant to who I am. Yeah, so that's good. I appreciate it. I, li I like that, the idea of a dream scenario of, of the, but from everything from the, from the service side to the marketing side and, and what that should feel like. And folks, need, you know, just take part of what Hope said there, but also brainstorm yourself. What do you want the customer to feel and how can you build that into what you do? So um, as we wrap up, any, any parting thoughts um, as well? You know, where should folks go to learn more about you, social, web, et cetera, and how to get in touch with you? What do you got? They should go to Telstra.com. We have a blog. We have a whole bunch of different white papers and other things. We're big believers in being evangelists for the industry overall. So there's a lot of really good information, even if you're not working with us or feel like you're a big brand, really helping to educate what you should be looking for and what are some of the critical trends that we're seeing among consumers, both at our brands, but also as we talk to consumers in the marketplace. Yeah, awesome. That was great. So um, thanks, Hope. Uh, folks, that was Hope Neiman, Chief Marketing Officer at Tilster. You can find all about how they help restaurants improve their results at www.tilster.com. That's T-I-L-L-S-T-E-R.com. And for more great restaurant marketing, operations, service, people, and tech tips, stay tuned to us here at runningrestaurants.com. We'll see you next time. Thanks.